Take two, we're going. Good, Good morning, morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your guest host, Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Krista Burns is uh, heading off to New York. It might actually be in the air as we speak. Okay, uh, either that or they, they're in Chicago, one or the other. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully they're in the air. Um, this week uh, we have Sally Snyder here from the Library Commission to do her best books of 2011 talk, best, best youth books of 2011 right. talk. So um, I'm going to, uh, I know she's, she's got a lot to talk about, so I'm just going to hand it right over to her as we go. Thank you, Michael. And I just want to tell you right now, we're going to go longer than an hour in order for me to get through my list. And I just had so many I, I thought were great for different reasons that that's what happened. And I want to tell you before we start on our slide that, that we have there, that you can access my list from the Library Commission's webpage. So I'm going to pop that up first. And if you, you see our home, our home page, and we've already typed here in the search button over here, typed in the word handouts. And you click on that, and then the top, so far, it's the top thing that comes up on the list that says Nebraska Library Commission handouts. Click on that, and then you come to this page, which so far is all about me, but other people could use it if they want to. Um, and maybe someday somebody else will have some lists up here, but it's mine for now. <laughs> Okay, and then right under here, whoops, sorry, that's NLA NEMA 2011 Conference Handouts, Best Youth Books, PDF. So click on that, and there's my PDF, and you'll see that this is my list with the order information you might need, plus you get my blurb right there on the page, and that's why it's 31 pages, which, you know, because I'm very verbose, I guess. But I wanted you to know where that was, so instead of writing frantically, you can jot down like the title or something else to remind you, and then you can go find this page and get all of the other information you might want to have. And we will provide a link to that in the show notes also for anybody who's listening to the recording. Good point. Okay, so I should have made that go smaller, shouldn't I? There we go. Okay. There we go. So here's here's the list. And these are books that I have encountered either the now a number of publishers send us review books, but not everybody. So if your favorite publisher is underrepresented, it's because they're not sending me anything or very much. I do go to the library, I read in the library journals for titles and information. So I try to be inclusive, but their best bet is to send me titles. <laughs> And um, with this list, I do start with the older teens and work down to preschool. So we'll start with fiction for older teens, and I apologize for this. This uh, is a compact disc that I checked out of. Oh, I forgot to tell you the other thing. I'm sorry, backing up. I forgot to update my date there on that starting screen, and I apologize for that. Okay, White Cat by Holly Black is the first book in the Curse Worker series. In a society where curse workers, or magic workers, are outlawed, organized crime is in control of all who can wield the power. Castle, 17, is the only member of his family with no curse power. He feels disconnected but still loyal to them. He works hard to blend into normal society, but recent events have him rethinking his place there. And the sequel is Red Glove, also by Holly Black, so this is book two. Castle Sharp thought he had no magical power, but he learned he was wrong in White Cat. Uh-oh, sorry, I gave that away. Now he is trying to decide what to do, join the Zakharov family, who are mobster types, and use his curse-working skills for them, or try to find some way to be normal. Wolfmark by Joseph Bruchot. Luke, who's 17, has learned a lot of things from his father and uncle. Martial arts, tracking, survival skills, and now he may need every skill he has learned. His father has been kidnapped, and Luke plans to rescue him. Along the way, he learns something more, that he, Luke, is a skinwalker, like his father. That means he can take on the form of a wolf, in his case. Bruchot blends native stories, European stories, danger, evil, and what it means to be human in his latest title. Payback Time by Carl Duker. Senior Mitch True has been the investigative reporter for the school paper, but this year he is assigned the sports beat. It isn't long before he is wondering what the coach is up to. Why is the obviously talented new player pretending to be average? He makes key plays when needed to win the game, but the rest of the time he stumbles along or sits on the bench. Soon Mitch and his sports photographer Kimmy are investigating. 
Prom and Prejudice by Elizabeth Ulberg. As a scholarship student at an elite boarding school, coming in for the first time as a junior, Lizzie Bennett is made to feel unworthy of attention by all the students except her roommate, Jane, one of the nicest people she knows. At a dance, Jane is smitten by Charles Bingley, and Lizzie suffers the snobbery of Will Darcy. Does this begin to sound familiar? <laughs> a modernized version of Pride and Prejudice is sure to appeal to younger readers, and it is uh, well done, maintains a lot of the plot with, of course, updates. This is the first book in a new series, The Secret Journey of Jack London. This, this title is The Wild by Christopher Golden and Tim Levin. Jack is 17 and turns 18 in the book. He travels to the Yukon to seek gold, and he soon joins up with two friendly guys he met on the trail. At first, their adventures are all wilderness-related, and they're pretty harrowing just to survive, but soon they turn supernatural. Alone, Jack runs from the Wendigo, and he encounters a siren-like young woman who cares for him as he heals. Escaping her may be harder than facing the Wendigo. It's a good look at the trials of facing such a wilderness with the added supernatural aspects of the story, which will probably appeal to teen readers. And I know those authors from, oh. uh, from adult fiction, oh, thank and, you. and those are both wonderful authors. Excellent. Blank Confession by Pete Hoffman. Shane Blank walks into the police station and calmly confesses to murder. The detective on duty, George Rawls, listens as Shane tells what happened. An unusual and compelling story, this is also the 2012-2013 One Book for Nebraska Teens. Skate Fade by Juan Felipe Herrera has lots of white sp space which will appeal to reluctant readers. However, this is not a quick read. Told all in poetry, Lucky Z is reconnecting to the world and celebrating life after an accident that left him in a wheelchair. The Odyssey, um, reimagined uh, by Gar Gareth Hines, a graphic novel version of the tale. What Hines accomplished with Beowulf, he now does with the Odyssey. A wonderful adaptation with color art, this will appeal to many. And it's a good place to start for teens who have not yet read Homer's version. Or really don't want to. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> I read Homer's version. <laughs> Five Flavors of Dumb by Anthony John. Piper is 18 and almost accidentally is offered the job of manager for her classmate's popular rock band called Dumb. This is a rather unusual job for someone who is deaf. Now if only she can keep them together and actually play music. Mercy by Rebecca Lim. She calls herself Mer Mercy, though she remembers nothing about her life. All she knows is that she wakes up in someone else's body, stays there for a time, days or weeks, it is never the same, and then moves on, remembering very little of what happened before. This time she is in Carmen, who is probably 16, a member of a high school choir group. The choir is staying in another town for two weeks. Carmen is staying in the room of a girl who disappeared two years ago. The parents have given up on her and are trying to return to normal, but her twin brother Ryan, who's about 18, is certain that she is still alive. For the first time, Mercy sees she can do something and make a difference. And soon, Ryan and, and Carmen, or Mercy as Com Carmen, are working together to find Lauren. A modern retelling of Jane Eyre, Jane takes a nanny job after, after having to drop out of college. She is working for the famous rock star Nico Rath Rathburn. It's well done, and my sister, who is a dyed-in-the-wool Jane Eyre fan, thoroughly enjoyed this version. So if she approves of it, I approve of it. Hot House by Chris Lynch. DJ and Russell, teens and sons of firefighters, work through the grief and the glory bestowed on them when their fathers die fighting the same fire. But soon, some rumors of wrongdoing begin to surface, and suddenly DJ and Russell are no longer the honored sons of the town. We wait with DJ to find out what the final ver verdict will be about what happened that night. Okay, another modern modernization. This is happening more and more. M Michelle Ray has written Falling for Hamlet. Modern day Denmark, Hamlet is prince, attending college not too far away. And Ophelia, a high school senior, is the daughter of the king's top advisor and PR person and a longtime friend of Hamlet. Told from Ophelia's point of view, the text occasionally includes excerpts from a police interview of her and periodic excerpts from an Oprah-like TV interview. These blend well into the story, believe it or not. <laughs> the author follows Shakespeare's story with only one or two huge differences, the first one being Ophelia lives. 
And all, the second one is that the final confrontation happens during a lacrosse game instead of a sword fight. The main characters retain their names, Horatio, Laertes, etc., while minor characters do not. So again, if you're looking for another way of experiencing Hamlet, this might be fun. Oh, Ocean of Blood by Darren Shane. This is book two of the Saga of Larkin Kretzley series, and it's um, uh, going to be four books altogether. They are prequels to the Cirque du Freak series. In this book, Larton is tired of older vampires telling him how to behave, so along with his blood brother, Wester, he goes out into the world and falls full tilt into the joys of being a vampire. So think lots of killing and other things. His enemies are waiting for the right moment. Natalie Standiford has written Confessions of the Sullivan Sisters. Told in three parts, we hear the confessions of Nori, Jane, and Sassy. For the affront, their grandmother has suffered. Called Almighty, their grandmother has demanded a confession from the one who perpetrated the unnamed act. No one is certain what got Almighty so upset, but since their family is dependent on her, all three girls confess their secrets. Numbers by Rachel Ward is set in London. Jem, who is 15, can see the date of the day someone will die if she looks in their eyes, so she rarely does that. She knows the date her best friend Spider will die. They are both in line for a ride on the London Eye when she realizes that everyone else in line has today's date in their eyes. As she and Spider run away, a bomb explodes. Afraid they will be accused they, and ex afraid to explain why they ran, they leave town together on the run. Spider doesn't know his day is coming soon, and Jem isn't sure what they should do next. Can she find a way to keep Spider alive? The Chaos by Rachel Ward is book two in the number series. Adam is 15, and he is the son of Jem from book one. Since he can remember, he can see the date a person will die if he looks in his or her eyes, like his mother could. But more than that, he can also feel what kind of death it will be, peaceful or painful, by knife or by catastrophe. He and his great-grandmother just moved back to London, and he is appalled at how many people have the date, January 1st, 2027, as their date. What will happen in six months, and can he do anything about it? The uh, third book and conclusion to the trilogy, Infinity, is due out May 1st of 2012. The Mockingbirds by Daisy Whitney. A junior at the boarding school, Themis Academy, Alex Patrick has trouble remembering how she ended up in Carter Hutchinson's bed. Over the next few days, she begins to remember bits and pieces of that night and finally realizes that she was date raped. Themis Academy faculty are so proud of all their students who are top students, they have no um, procedure in place to handle any kind of complaint like this. So the students have set up their own justice system and they call it the Mockingbirds. Some teen nonfiction include Sugar Changed the World, a story of magic, spice, slavery, freedom, and science by Mark Aronson and Marina Budos. This is exactly what it says, the history of sugar and its effects on religion, politics, and humanity. And also, it's sugar's several sources and forms. And I believe this is on the list for the, the five um, Morris Award. Is it Morris Award? Or? Hmm. I think Don't so. I should have checked that, sorry. <laughs> This is fascinating, How They Croaked by Georgia Bragg. A look at the deaths of 19 famous people from King Tut to Albert Einstein. The people are listed chronologically. Six to eight pages are given to each person with a two-page spread after each that explains one or two or three things about them or things that were of their time. It's great for browsing. I think particularly reluctant readers will be enthralled with all the information available in this book. Sky Sailors, True Stories of the Balloon Era is by David Bristow. He's a Nebraska author, and this is the 2011 Nebraska Center for the Book Young Adult Nonfiction Award winner. It's excellent nonfiction that reads like a story. Readers will learn about the experimentation and dangers of the balloon era, something teens may not have encountered before. Illustrated with numerous photos and handbills of the time, it also includes notes and a bibliography. The Bat Scientists by Mary Kay Carlson is another excellent title in the Scientists in the Field series. And the lure of bats should make this title popular. And those vampire bats on the cover, oh yeah, that'll grab them. <laughs> Science Fair Season by Judy Dutton is actually an adult book, but I think it's something that could really appeal to teen readers. It's a fascinating look at six of the contestants for the 2009 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, ISEF, 
as well as some of the winners from previous years. Each chapter is dedicated to one amazing student telling how they became interested in their subject, what their project is about, and how they progress from local to regional to the international competition. The author has an easygoing style that is appealing and does an admirable job of explaining some of the more intricate scientific issues surrounding the projects, because even I understood them. So, thumbs up to her. This is a wonderful book for casual science readers as well as an inspiration for future science fair competitors. Sir Charlie Chaplin, The Funniest Man in the World by Sid Fleischman. This is the author's last book. He passed away in March of 2010. This gives the reader a look at Charlie Chaplin from childhood poverty in London to his fame in silent movies. Flashman does not ignore some of Chaplin's faults, both personal and professional. He also includes some details about early movie making while keeping the reader engaged. Sparky, The Life and Art of Charles Schultz by Beverly Gurman, a positive biography of the Funny Pages artists. Uh, she doesn't really mention anything negative about his life or art. And this may inspire future generations to give it a try, if they've heard of him. Father Abraham, Lincoln and His Sons by Harold Holzer. A biography of Lincoln and his family focusing, of course, on Lincoln's relationship with his sons. Numerous illustrations and photographs from the time break up the text and add interest. As Booklist noted, this look at Lincoln's family also gives the reader insight into Lincoln's personality. And it's an excellent look at life in the 1800s. The Dark Game, True Spy Stories by Paul Janesco. Written in an appealing way, this title blends intriguing facts with some well-known and some not so well-known spies in history. Beginning with the American Revolutionary War, the author identifies some of the spies that saved our revolution and notes some of their methods. He moves on to the American Civil War, World War I and II, and the Cold War, concluding with two cases of U.S. agents turning over secrets to others. Very fascinating, and teens are often fascinated by by spies. Okay, I hopped on to Built to Last by David McCauley. This combines three previously published books in one volume. Castle, Cathedral, and Mosque are included with some updates, and now they are also in full color, sure to attract browsers. So if you have, have had the others but now are missing some, you can buy that to get all three. I love his books. Oh, they're so, yeah. <laughs> they're great, aren't they? The Crossing by Jim Murphy, How George Washington Saved the American Revolution, is an excellent book at Washington's crossing of the Delaware River. The author gives good background before presenting the event. How and why Washington was chosen to command the Continental Army, early battles and skirmishes, Washington's plans for the crossing, and why, after such a victory, he decided on a night march to Princeton. Another excellent book by an award-winning author. Okay, fiction for younger teens. Forge by Lori Hoss Anderson is the sequel to Chains and book two in the Seeds of America trilogy. Curzon, abandoned by Isabel, stumbles into a battle and becomes one of General George Washington's troops. You could pair this with the previous book, nonfiction book, if you wanted to do that. The author's descriptions of the lives of revolutionary soldiers at Valley Forge give a sense of the terrible conditions there. Curzon makes friends and enemies, fears being called a runaway slave, because he is, and wonders about the future. When he encounters Isabel again, he is determined that they should both run fast and far. And book three is on the way. King of Ithaca by Tracy Barrett. Odysseus has been gone for years, 16 years since he left his son Telemachus is almost a man. Things are getting more tense in Ithaca, so Telemachus heeds the advice of a visiting sea captain and sails off searching for news of his father. His voyage to visit Pylos and Sparta guide him to be a better man and a better future king. This story is a bit different from the one we have heard before because Odysseus doesn't, doesn't come off quite so well in this one. But it has action and adventure and a little intrigue. Around the World in a Hundred Days by Gary Black, Blackwood. Twenty years after Phileas Fogg went around the world in 80 days, his son Harry is caught in a similar situation. This time Harry was expounding on motor cars and how they will take over from horses and buggies. And he insisted that the model he and a friend have developed is far superior to any other. Now he must drive all the way, except when crossing water, in 100 days or lose the bet he can't afford. Great fun, some danger, and of course some trouble. Uncommon Criminals by Allie Carter is a sequel to Heist Society. Kat, Katerina, is 15 and she has chosen to leave the family business, stealing art and jewels, etc., for profit, and she is now stealing art in order to return it to their proper owners. 
Then she is asked to steal the Cleopatra emerald. The biggest problems with this is she cannot use any of her regular cons, and the emerald is cursed. Matched by Ali Condi is reminiscent of The Giver. Cassia lives in a well-ordered society without fear, poverty, or uncertainty. When she is matched with her friend Sander at the match banquet, she is certain her match is perfect. But a computer glitch shows her the face of someone else, Kai, an aberration who is not allowed a match. This begins her discovery of the flaws of the society. Book two of the trilogy, Crossed, is now out and is also excellent. The Scorch Trials by James Dashner is the sequel to Maze Runner. The survivors of the maze are told they have two weeks to walk 100 miles straight north to the safe haven. If they get there, they will receive an antidote to the disease, the flare, and maybe their trials will be over. 100 miles of des desolation except for the city which houses the cranks, people who are um, afflicted with the flare and are going crazy and are extremely dangerous. It's a compelling story and uh, the death cure came out in October, so I haven't read that one yet, but fascinating. Um, Joseph Delaney has written Rage of the Fallen. This is a continuation in the Last Apprentice series. War still rages in the county, so Tom, the spook, and Alice must travel to Ireland, where they could end up facing the Morrigan, or even the Fiend, also known as the Devil. Irish mages are trying to connect with Pan, who is not interested, and a witch may also be after Tom, so they've got plenty of danger and excitement with a few scary for me, because I am a wimp in the scary department. A few scary scenes. Brain Jack by Brian Faulkner. Sam Wilson is 17 and he is a hacker who was caught by Homeland Security. He is now working for them, helping to catch potential hackers who threaten the security of the nation. The newest thing are neuro headsets which connect to the brain. Sam can move much faster through the internet with one, but maybe they are not such a good idea. Cloaked by Alex Flint, Finn, sorry, the character's name is Flynn. The author's name is Finn. No, reverse that. I have it wrong on my page. Okay, Alex Flynn is the author of Cloaked. The character's name is Finn, and he is 17 and a cobbler as his father and grandfather before him. He wants to go and see the world, but he stays to help his mother because his father has disappeared many years ago. His best friend works in the restaurant of the Grand Hotel that houses his mother's shop. One day, the beautiful Princess Victoriana of Valoria secretly asks him to find her brother, who has been turned into a frog by a witch. This is the beginning of the blending of several fairy tales that is full of adventure, intrigue, and some humor. Bellboy, a sister in the rebel ranks by Ann Fuller, is a Nebraska author. Samantha, now called Sam, has joined the Confederate ranks disguised as a boy as she tries to find her brother, listed as missing after a battle. And this is a kind of unique because um, most of the time when you read about a woman or, or a girl who disguises herself, it's for the Union side, and this is in the Confederate side. Reckless by Cornelia Funke. Jacob Reckless has been visiting the land through the mirror in his father's office, and his job there is to find fairy tale items for customers in that land he calls Mirror World. His father disappeared years ago, and just this trip his younger brother Will has followed him into Mirror World just in time to be bitten by a goyle. Now Will begins to change from flesh to a stony skin. He is becoming Jade, and Jacob is desperate to help him. I think there's going to be another book in, about these characters. Okay, if you're still into vampires, here we go. Vampire Rising by Jason Henderson is the first book in the Alex Van Helsing series. Alex is 14, and he's been sent to an academy near Lake Geneva in Switzerland. And all his life, he's been told that his last name has nothing to do with that guy in the stories years ago. Oh, yes, it does. He is the great-great-great-grandson of the Van Helsing, and he is about to get in the middle of an ongoing fight against evil. Plenty of action in this book that makes a great start to a new series for those who are interested in vampires. Red Cell by John Kalkowski is also a Nebraska author. Major League Baseball action adds to the story of terrorists and the fight against them. Will Conlan, in middle school, unintentionally discovers a connection between a commercial on television and the terrorist's target. Who will believe him and who can he tell? Excalibur, The Legend of King Arthur by Tony Lee is told in graphic novel format, and this version of the well-known tale will 
appeal to reluctant readers and King Arthur fans. It's very well done, and I have an approval by a graphic novel reader to, for this one, so it's always nice when other people <laughs> verify your opinions. <laughs> the Body at the Tower by Y.S. Lee is the second book in the Mary Quinn mystery series. In Victoria, London, Mary is now 18, and her second assignment for the secret detective agency, which happens to be all women, is to disguise herself as a boy and work at the construction site of the Houses of Parliament and the Clock Tower as an errand boy to try to discover any information concerning one man's death and the perpetual delays in the construction. Given some insight into the plight of the everyday worker of, worker of the time, especially young boys, it's an interesting mystery about a strong, capable woman with a little touch of romance, because we always like that, we women readers. The Power of Six by Pitticus Lore is the second book in the Lorian Legacy series. John Smith of the first book, I Am Number Four, is on the run with Number Six and his best friend, Sam. Alternating chapters tell their story and the story of Marina, who is Number Seven, hiding with her mentor in a Spanish convent. From Lorian, another planet, they have been hidden on Earth until they come into their powers. Their powers have begun to appear, and the first three have been killed by the Mogadorians. They believe that there's nine who made it to Earth. But maybe there's ten. Mm -mm. And then if you count the three who have been killed already. Um, there's going to be at least one more title in this series, and it's uh, really appealing and leaves you on edge, of course. Trash by Andy Mulligan is about three boys who live on a huge trash pile and some of the many people who sift through what is there to find what can be sold or made use of. One day they find a bag with some paper and a key in it. Now begins their search for what the key unlocks and what might be inside. Their lives are in danger since the police showed up to ask all the dwellers to look for the bag. This could be their jackpot or their downfall. The author notes that he based the dump in the book on one he visited while he was living in Manila because I never had a sense of where exactly they were, and I think he did that on purpose. This is the second book in a new series, The Cruisers. They are Xander, Cambui, Lasanda, and Bobby. Oh, sorry, this is, title is Checkmate by Walter D. Myers. Um, they all attend the Da Vinci Academy in Harlem. The assistant principal has asked the cruisers to befriend Sidney Aronsky and find out why he has been picked up for drug use. He really didn't use it, he was just asking where to buy some. He's the school star chess player, and drugs don't fit with who he is. Book three, Center Stage, is on the way. Walter Dean Myers and Ross Workman work together to write this book titled Kick. Myers tells us about Kevin Johnson, 13, who was accused of stealing a car and wrecking it on a light pole. Told from alternating viewpoints, that of Kevin and that of Police Sergeant Jerry Brown, who was trying to find out what really happened. It's a compelling story, and... The alternate chapters are written by the two different authors. Yummy, The Last Days of a South Side Shorty by G. Neary. This graphic novel with black and white art is a blending of fiction and nonfiction and is based on a Chicago event from 1994. The author noted several sources he used and tells the story of an 11-year-old boy who became both a perpetrator and a victim of violence as a member of a gang. It's a chilling and powerful story. Three Quarters Dead by Richard Peck tells of Carrie, who's a soft sophomore. She is stunned and thrilled when three of the most popular seniors invite her to join them in their gang or their group. They hang out together, but one day the three older girls are killed in a car accident. Carrie was supposed to be with them, but she wasn't on time. Then, a while later, the Queen Bee calls Carrie on the phone and asks her to come into the city and join the three of them. This ghost story with the additional appeal of joining the in crowd may appeal to more than the ghost story fans of young adult fiction. Virals by Kathy Reichs is the first young adult book by the author. And this is a new series. Tori Brennan is niece to Temperance Brennan of Reichs' adult series and TV show Bones. She lives with her father, a marine biologist. She and her friends, all boys, are accidentally exposed to a manufactured strain of parvovirus, which has profound effect on their systems. They become embroiled in an old murder and a new mystery about who is behind it all. It's compelling with lots of action, but maybe a little bit too much description there because it's a pretty thick book, but the idea of uh, certain powers coming into place is always appealing to teen readers. There was just a second one, wasn't there? there a second one has come out, but I mm -hmm. haven't read it yet. I can't even think of the title. Mm. It's bad. Check that out. Yeah, I will. Thank you. <laughs> Illegal by Bettina Restrepo. Restrepo. 
Nora is 14 and she and her mother and grandmother live in Cedula, Mexico and they are trying to keep their orchard going. Papa has been gone three years north to Houston to work on construction. When the money stopped coming, Nora insisted that she and her mother go to Houston to find her father. The 10-hour trip in the back of a mango truck and their arrival in Houston with no idea how to find her father and how to live show the gritty side of life for those who are here illegally. Nora finds she must take the lead, try to find work, and not give up. It includes a glossary of Spanish words. Seizure. Seizure is the, the second book in that series by Kathy Reichs. Thank you. You're welcome. Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children by Ransom Riggs is a, an interesting and fascinating book. After his grandfather's death, Jacob, 16, travels with his father to an isolated <coughs> island near Wales, Wales. There he finds the ruins of the orphanage his grandfather was sent to during World War II. Jacob accidentally finds a way to the past and learns that the children at the orphanage have unique and unusual abilities and now are in terrible danger. It's illustrated with occasional unusual actual photographs from the past like the one on the cover. And the mystery and action will certainly appeal to reluctant readers, and you know there's going to be another. It's got to be another book <laughs> after this one. Oh, you thought the 39 clues were done. No, they're not. <laughs> the first series is done. Vespers Rising by Rick Riordan is um, listed as 39 clues book 11, and this is kind of a transition book to the new series. And this begins with Gideon Cahill in 1507, moves to Madeline Cahill, Cahill in 1526, on to Grace Hay Hill in 1942, and then up to Amy and Dan Cahill in present day, as it shows who the Vespers are and what they're after. The Vespers want the formula that the, everybody was looking for in the first 10 books. And now we know that the Cahills versus Vespers series of 39 Clues is starting with the Medusa plot by Gordon Corman. One or more Cahills from each of the five branches have been kidnapped. The Vespers want the formula and demand one, one step at a time toward the goal within a designated time limit or one of them will die. Can Amy and Dan complete the task assigned to them or will Nellie die is what they're concerned about. It is a bit strange to have the other Cahill families helping instead of hindering them, but Amy and Dan both know the world is at stake if the Vespers end up with the formula. Uh, the second book is out now. It's titled A King's Ransom by Jude Watson. Oh, I love this book. Okay for Now by Gary Schmitz. It's a sequel to The Wednesday Wars. This book has several levels of action throughout. Doug Swiatek in eighth grade and his family must move to a small town where his father has a new job. Adjusting to a new place, no friends, and a Saturday job for himself is a lot to handle. He stops in at the library, which is open only on Saturdays, and he is soon learning about art as he protests that he doesn't like to draw, but he's drawing. Add on his brother returning from Vietnam, his father continuing to be a jerk. Dog, Doug has a lot to handle, but he is beginning to step into his own. Alexander Gordon Smith has written Solitary. This is the sequel to... I don't have... Lockdown? Yes, thank you. Lockdown. Um, Alex Sawyer is 14. He was a thief and a bully, but he was not a murderer. Still, he was sent to Furnace, the ultimate prison for murdering his friend. This is book two, and Alex Z and Gary Owens believe they have escaped at the end of book one, but it is not true. Alex and Z are sent to solitary, and something even worse is happening to Gary Owens. It's an extremely bleak and life-threatening place in solitary, but the boy Simon, who is somehow loose on his own, finds them, and his confidence in Alex's ability to find a way out gives them all hope. Maybe they can escape Furnace. But book three is Death Sentence. And no, they didn't get out of Furnace. <laughs> Alex struggles to remember his name as he is slowly changed into a monster. He feels the strength and power the special formula puts into him, and all he wants to do is kill and destroy. But one reminder of his name from a boy begins to pull him back from the monster. And book four, titled The Fugitives, is due out in early 2012. The Ring of Solomon by Jonathan Stroud is a prequel to the Bartamius trilogy. This title gives us another chance to spend time with the wise-cracking footnote-writing genie, Bartamius. It is still an alternate world. Magicians use imps and genies as slaves. Bartamius was summoned by one of King Solomon's magicians and is forced to do his bidding. The Queen of Sheba sends her most trusted guard, young Esmira, 
to Jerusalem to kill King Solomon and steal his powerful ring. The fun really begins when Asmira and Bartamius meet up. Secrets are uncovered and surprises are in store. Bad Island by Doug Tenapel. This is a bad island. <laughs> it's a graphic novel by the author-illustrator of Gostopolis. A bad storm strands a family of four on an unusual island. Strange plants, creatures, and human-like beings reveal how bad it really is. An alternating story about beings in another part of space is interspersed with the story of mom, dad, teen Reese, and preteen Janie, all doing their best to survive. It's uh, full-color art, and that brings the creepy, scary, bizarre, and sometimes cute creatures to life. Cloaked in Red by Vivian Van Velde has eight short story parodies of the fairy tale Little Red Riding Hood. As she did with the Rumpelstiltskin problem, Van Velde starts by noting some issues with the story, such as why would people name a child after clothing? Uh, apparently she has an issue with that. She I've, oh. I've met Vivian. She's, oh, she's a hoot. Yeah. <laughs> she includes humor and different main characters in the stories to add to the fun and interest of the twists. Small Acts of Amazing Courage by Gloria Whelan. India of 1919. Rosalind, 15, lives with her mother and has had quite a bit of freedom while her father was away in the British military during World War I and after. She takes a couple of risks to help someone as she struggles with the idea of a class system and why some people have so much and others have so little. She is found out and sent home to England, where she's never been, to live with ants she doesn't know. Gandhi and the possible freedom of India intrigue her. The book gives a good sense of the time and place and also gives readers some food for thought. Warp Speed by Lisa Yi. As one of the members of the AV club, those students who keep the equipment running, Marley in seventh grade is also a Star Trek fan. His best friend is a Star Wars fanatic. Uh -oh. And they get along just fine, but they uh -oh. are very, <laughs> very judgmental of people who don't know the difference, as they should be. You should know the difference. Marley is regularly chased by bullies, and he is able to outrun them if the way is clear. The track coach keeps asking him to try out for the team, but, is, but it is his friends in the AV club who trick him into doing so. Now everything could change if he becomes a jock. Can a jock be in the AV club? Fiction for grades 2 to, to 5 or somewhere around there. By the way, my divisions are kind of, you know, nebulous because we all know that different kids are ready for different books at different times, so these are just general categories. Tom Engelberger has written The Strange Case of Origami Yoda. I love this book. It's a collection of stories about advice an origami Yoda gives to students in the sixth grade at Macquarie Middle School. The stories are collected by Tommy, who is friends with the kind of weird kid Dwight who made origami Yoda and walks around with it on his finger. Okay, can you imagine walking around middle school with an origami Yoda on your finger all the time? Tommy is collecting information because he wants to know if he should trust Origami Yoda with a very important question about a girl, and he is puzzled that Origami Yoda gives such good advice when Dwight is rather clueless. There are instructions in the back on how to make an Origami Yoda. And Darth Paper Strikes Back! Tom Engelberger has brought us a sequel. Now in seventh grade, Tommy finds it necessary to put together another notebook about Origami Yoda. This time it is in defense of Dwight, who may be sent to reform school. Harvey has created a Darth Vader pa paper puppet, and he is determined to force Dwight to admit Origami Yoda is only paper also. What gets Dwight in trouble is when Origami Yoda tells Jen, Zero hour comes. I can't do uh, or Yoda language. Oh, Yoda, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Zero hour comes. Prepare to meet your doom. This was interpreted by the principal as threatening speech and bullying. Another entertaining story with lots of doodles on the edges of the pages, and that's in the first book, too. It also has instructions on how to make an emergency five-fold origami Yoda, which I could do, yay! <laughs> and a bit more complicated Darth paper, which I didn't try. I wanted to stay with my success. Ivy and Bean, What's the Big Idea by Annie Barrows. This is book seven about Ivy and Bean. The second grade class is going to the school science fair with ideas to help alleviate global warming. Ivy and Bean are enthusiastic. They just can't come up with an idea. The Chihuahua Chase by A.E. Cannon. Addie is in fourth grade, and she wonders why Teddy Krebs picks on her so much. But when his Chihuahua Phantom disappears, she teams up with him to try to find the dog. Two or maybe three possible candidates for dog nappers will keep the readers guessing. It's a good early chapter book choice, and frequent illustrations break up the text. 
Magic at the Bed and Biscuit by Joan Karras is a, a sequel to two other books in this series about the bed and biscuit. Grandpa is a vet and he has some livestock, but he also boards pets on his place. And the animals you see in this book in the foreground, they are all his helpers, and they're the ones that tell the story. A magician leaves Militia his silky bantam, bantam and part of his act to get some rest. Mostly she gets bored and plays tricks on the other animals. Ernest, the pig there, still continues to uphold Grandpa's philosophy of treating their guests with kindness and understanding while trying to come with, up with a way to give Militia her comeuppance. It's good fun and, a perf and perfect for readers just past the beginning reader level. And I like the way Ernest came up with an idea that puts her in her place without being mean. And that's the tricky thing. This is the first book in a, a graphic novel series by Scott Chandler, Tower of Treasure, and the series is called The Three Thieves. Dessa is 14 and she's an acrobat with a traveling troupe and always looking for her twin brother. She is talked into helping her two fellow performers, Topper and Fisk, to rob the Queen's treasury. They almost succeed, but instead are on the run. This is a good introduction to the characters in the plot with more adventure on the way because book two is The Sign of the Black Rock, also by Scott Chandler. Dessa, Topper, and Fisk are on the run, and the Queen's top men, the dragons, are after them. They find a place to wait out the rain when the tavern keeper's wife hides them in the barn. Then a number of Queen's men arrive for shelter, and it seems the fugitives are bound to be caught. And I don't have uh, any clue as to how many books might be coming in the series, but it's very interesting um, so far. A Nest for Celeste by Henry Cole. Celeste, a small mouse who loves to weave baskets, lives in a southern style, a plantation type house. She is bullied by two rats who often steal her food. But one day she encounters a young guest who enjoys her company and keeps her in his pocket. He is the apprentice to Mr. Ottoman, who is there to collect specimens for his project. Celeste has some wonderful and some scary adventures and makes some friends. Oh, I love this series. Uh, Doreen Cronin has written her first um, novel, uh, The Trouble with Chickens. This is a J.J. Tully, Tully mystery, book one. J.J. is a retired rescue dog, and it was not his idea to retire. He is relaxing in his doghouse when a chicken enters with a desperate case. Two of her chicks are missing. J.J. takes the case for a hamburger, a cheeseburger, excuse me. Humors, some twists, and a likable hero are a good combination by a well-known author. And the sequel is The Legend of Diamond Lil. I think it's out, but I haven't seen a copy of it yet. Vivian French has written The Flight of Dragons. This is the fourth tale of the Five Kingdoms. The evil twins, Conducta and Globula, are forced out of their home to find work, but they have no intention of working. Instead, they team up with their exiled father, the horrible villain, Old Malignancy, who is hoping to take over the Five Kingdoms. There is also a rumor of a dragon egg that is ready to hatch, and everyone wants it. The true heart, Greasy Gillypot, and her friend, Prince Marcus, once again team up with some helpful bats and a friendly troll, Gubble, to straighten everything out. Adventure and magic, these stories read like fairy tales, and they're, it's illustrated with occasional line drawings. A Tale Dark, Dark and Grim by Adam Gidwitz takes some of the lesser known original grim fairy tales and cleverly winds Hansel and Gretel through them. It starts with their adapted story, they get their heads cut off and then reattached. He has them continue through their kingdom beyond, sometimes separately, to encounter the various troubles of the other fairy tales. The author occasionally addresses the reader throughout the book, at first mostly to request that all young children leave the room, for he tells the bloody gruesome original versions of the stories, and to warn, as on page 16, this is where things start to get, well, awesome, but in a terrible, bloody kind of horrible way. It sounds awful, but it is a wonderful reworking of the fairy tales, and kids will be fascinated by the story. Sophie Simon Solves Them All by Lisa Graff. Sophie is in the third grade, and she is quite smart and loves to read big, heavy books on difficult topics like calculus. Her parents are quite a pair. They worry that she has no friends and call her names that escalate from sugar plum to my darling lettuce wedge. They want only the best for her. Three students in her class each have a problem, and they confide in her, and Sophie may have the solutions. And the readers will love how she blends all these together and kind of stirs it up and... and um, it also, it's great to see that it is not bad to be smart. The Call by Mark Michael Grant is the first book in the Magnificent Twelve series. When a boy, when a 3,000-year-old man appears to Mac McAvoy, who is 12 and in the seventh grade, 
In the boys' room at school, he is startled when he is told he is one of the Magnificent Twelve, and his task is to find the other eleven and save the world before it is taken over by the Pale Queen and her daughter. Mac has numerous phobias and is not your typical hero. Stefan, 15, also in seventh grade, is the ultimate bully, but he suddenly decides to help Mac with this task after Mac saved his life. The book contains adventure and humor. The series is off to a great start. And book two in the series is titled The Trap. Mac, his friend Stefan, and Jara, the second of the twelve, fly from Australia to China to seek the nine dragons of Deku and the rest of the Magnificent Twelve. Mac is concerned because he thinks the last thing Grimlock said was, beware of trap. Humor, adventure, and magic and more are in store for Mac and his friends. And again, I'm not sure how many books are, are expected in this series, but it's also great fun I, so I'd far. I guess 12. Good thinking, but they've already <laughs> picked up more people. Oh, okay. Sorry, Almost Zero by Nikki Grimes <laughs> is book three about Diamond Daniel. Diamond makes a big mistake in telling her mother she wants a brand new pair of red tennis shoes, and it is her mother's job to provide what she wants. No, provide what she needs. The, tech, the terminology is important. Mm -hmm. The next day after school, Diamond, Diamond comes home to find that she has no other clothes or shoes. Her mom says that she is providing what Diamond needs, but nothing more. She has a bed, she has a chair, that's all. Diamond is mad and sad until a schoolmate's family loses everything in a fire. Then Diamond gets busy helping. Mission Unstoppable by Dan Gutman is the first book in the Genius Files. Lots of action, danger, and humor. Twins Coke and Pepsi, who are almost 13, are traveling across the country in an RV with their parents. They must avoid assassins, solve puzzles, and save the world without their parents finding out. And my only complaint about this book was about halfway through, they're deciding whether they should go to Carhenge or Kansas. Oh. The big ball of twine in Kansas. Car hinge. They go to Kansas. I was oh. good for Kansas, sad for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great fun, of course, Dan Gutman. The Ghost of Crutchfield Hall by Mary Downing Hahn will surely be popular because it's a ghost story by a well-known author. Florence is 12 and has been an orphan for several years when she was call has been called to Crutchfield Hall to live with her great uncle and her cousin James, an invalid since his older sister Sophia's death six months ago. It isn't long until Sophia is materializing and influencing Florence to do things. How can James and Florence send Sophia away? It's another good ghost story set outside London in the 1800s. Zapato Power by Jacqueline Jules. This is a great fun. Freddy finds a box addressed to him at his apartment door with no return address. It contains a pair of purple shoes with wings on the side and a note that says, Zapato Power for Freddy Ramos. No clue who gave them to him. He tries out the shoes and he can outrun the train. Now his dreams of becoming a superhero can become reality, but he is at school all day. How can a superhero be heroic at school? Well, he does find some small ways to be heroic because he knows he has to keep his identity secret. A sequel is in the way. I don't know if it's out yet. Freddie Ramos springs into action. So, great fun. Till Death Do Us Bark by Kate Cleese is book three in the 43 Old Cemetery Road series. A large dog follows Seymour home from the library, and he wants to keep it. Ignatius, a children's book author, and Olive, a ghost, and his adoptive parents are not enthusiastic. It turns out the dog had belonged to Noah Breath, who recently passed away. Soon Noah's son and daughter arrive, and they are looking for his millions. Told in their usual style of no narrative, just letters, new newspaper articles, illustrations, and notes, readers will either love the format or want nothing to do with it. I happen to love the format myself, so I think it's fun. Framed by Gordon Corman is a sequel to Swindle and Zoo Break. Griffin Bing, the man with the plan, is accused of stealing the Super Bowl ring from the school display case. Evidence supports the accusation, but Griffin didn't do it. Can the team prove him innocent before he is sent to juvie jail? Action, great planning, and lots of humor make this third book just as fun as the first two. The Unicorn's Tale by R. L. Lefevers is book four of the Nathaniel Fled Beastologist series. The short chapters and frequent illustrations will appeal to readers. Nate is 10 and his Aunt Phil is training him in the family business of beastology, which is working to protect and save and keep secret numerous mythological creatures. Um, in this episode, they are have to go help a unicorn who is uh, ill and the situation becomes dire. But all that Nathaniel can think about are that maybe his parents are not dead, but simply missing. 
Wingding by Kevin Markey is book three in the Super Slugger series. The all-star game will be played on the Ramble Town field this year, except that an enormous horde of grasshoppers blew in on the gusty wind and proceeded to eat all the grass. The wind continues to blow hard. The team's crack shortstop has the yips. Lots of sports action with some humor and steady team support, and it still has the occasional film noir language. It's great fun, and along with sports action. Stephen McCraney has written Mal and Chad, the biggest, bestest time ever. Graphic novel format in black and white cartoon-like art, Mal, a fourth grade genius, keeps his knowledge and brains to himself. He knows if anyone finds out, he will end up in college immediately, and he wants to continue to enjoy being a kid. He's pretty smart. His dog, Chad, can talk with him, and they have many adventures together. Mal loves inventing things, and that includes a time machine, which they use to travel back in time to the age of the dinosaurs. Of course, there are several difficulties about getting back, and there's a sequel out I haven't seen yet, so I have to keep an eye out for that one. Lucy the Bad or Good by Marianne Musgrove. Lucy has been having some bad days. A Cynthia at school is always picking on her, but the teacher never catches her and she sometimes makes bad decisions. Her great aunt from Holland comes to visit and things get harder for Lucy. Maybe she really is a bad kid. A blending of cultures, Lucy lives in Australia and Tante Beth is from Holland with her own ideas as to how things are or should be. But Tante Beth does have a soft side too. Rescue on Tankium 3 by Jake Parker is the second book in the Missile Mouse series. This graphic novel continues the adventures of the Galactic Security Agency's best agent, Missile Mouse. He does tend to blow things up and get in trouble with his boss, though. In this adventure, Missile Mouse must take a team of security bots and a robotic assistant with him, and he is against the use of robots for this duty. They travel to the planet Tankium-3, where the local inhabitants' minds are being controlled so they will work at slave labor in the mines. This is a job for Missile Mouse and Robot 44. Big Nate in a class by himself, and Big Nate Strikes Again by Lincoln Pierce. Nate, who is in sixth grade, but he looks younger to me, is a bit of a troublemaker. He is not fond of school. And in Big Nate in a class by himself, his fortune cookie tells him he will surpass all others. Nate spends a day trying to do that, but all he does is get detention over and over again. Lots of humor, cartoon-like drawings reminiscent of Wimpy Kid, and interesting characters. The character Nate Wright and his companions began as a comic strip, and now they are in book format. Big Nate strikes again. Nate is paired with his nemesis, Gina, on a research project about a famous American. They both feel this is a tragedy. <laughs> Nate, because Gina is so know-it-all, and Gina, because she is sure her grade point average will suffer. As funny and appealing as the first book, to the first book, and there, is, there are also two companion books that are all the comic strips, or most of the comic strips in them, and a third book just came out that I haven't seen yet. Oh, wait. There it is. There, okay, there's a fourth book. Sorry, <laughs> this is Big Nate on a roll. Archer has joined Nate's Timber Scout troop, and Nate feels the pain as Archer is soon selling many more warm fuzzies and appears that he will win the first prize for safe sales, which is a new skateboard. This volume maintains the humor, fun, and horrible circumstances of the first two books with lots of drawings. No Such Thing as Dragons by Philip Reed. Ansel, 10, has been mute since his mother passed away three years ago. His father eagerly arranges for Ansel to serve Johann Brock, a reasonably successful dragon hunter. Brock confines in Ansel that there really are no such thing as dragons, but there is the fear of dragons, so he always has work. This trip, though, he might be wrong. Very wrong. People and animals have disappeared, and the town folk of the mountain village are desperate for help. More death is on the way. <laughs> the Four Stall by Chris Rylander. Sixth grader Mac helps the grade school kids with what they need. Trouble with bullies? Need some advice? Mac can help you for a reasonable fee. Vince is his right-hand man, keeping track of the money. Their office is in a never-used bathroom, the fourth stall. But one day, Mac finds out about a guy who is collecting gambling debts and putting pressure on the students. When Mac takes him on, Mac may end up squashed. Because Mac really is help. He's not taking advantage of the kids. He's really helping them. I, I just want this cover because of the takeoff on The Godfather. I mean, that oh, that, that oh, is yes. a comp I mean, yes. oh, that just, yeah, sorry. Good I just <laughs> I just saw that. I'm like, that's The Godfather cover. It is. It is. <laughs> I forgot all about that. <laughs> Haunted Houses by Robert Sansusi. This is Are You Scared Yet? series book one. Ten stories of haunted houses, some grim, some hopeful, written to scare, and they mostly succeed. 
I did read all the score stories and I survived. Some are pretty creepy. There's one illustration for, per story, and it should be popular with readers who like the hair raised on the back of their necks. And if, you, if you're scared of spiders, don't read this book. <laughs> Sidekicks by Dan Santat. Harry, also known as Captain Amazing, has two pets, a dog and a hamster. He hasn't had a sidekick since the claw, his cat, disappeared. Now he is beginning a search for a new sidekick, and both the dog and hamster hope to be chosen. And so does the chameleon Harry just brought home. And what about the claw? It's great fun. Spaceheads Book 2 by John Cheska. Things are getting more complicated. Jennifer, Bob, and Fluffy, the, camp, the class hamster, are from another planet and are here to get 3.14 million and one Earthlings to be spaceheads. Michael Caine, um, seeing that they need more help to spread the word and protect Jennifer and Bob, reveals the aliens to his friends TJ and Venus. They soon are all working on some plans to get more space heads. You can go to the website and sign up to be a space head if oh, you want to. It's in the book. There's lots of illustrations and wacky going on, goings on in this book. And book three has come out. I haven't seen it yet either. I have to catch up. Aliens on Vacation by Cleet Barrett Smith. David, nicknamed Scrub, is sent from Florida where he had all kinds of plans with his best friend to Washington to stay with his grandmother for the summer before seventh grade. She has a bed and breakfast, and he is certain a long, boring summer of labor is ahead. He soon learns that his grandmother's reputation as a crazy lady is well-founded. Her visitors are from other planets, but nobody knows that except her. Soon Scrub is helping the new arrivals touch up their disguises and trying to keep the prying sheriff, who knows something is off with the place, out of his grandmother's hair. Humorous, sympathetic aliens and some tension about being discovered will keep readers involved. Storm Runners by Roland Smith is book one of a proposed trilogy. Chase Masters is 12, and he and his father have been traveling the country for a year, helping people rebuild after disasters, for a fee, of course. Chase changes school so often it's hard to count. Now they are in Florida with a hurricane on the way. And while his dad thinks Chase is in a safe area, the hurricane may end up right where he is. Um, it's a great adventure. The first book does have a conclusion to one part of the story, but a cliffhanger for the other. And one of the things that readers will love is that Chase, have, being in the situations with his father all this time, has a backpack full of equipment that he might need at any time. He has a lot of knowledge that, of course, adults ignore. And um, if only they listened to him, they would have helped. Roland has also written The Surge, which is book two. The hurricane has passed, but Chase, Nicole, and Rashawn are still in danger. Getting to the farm, the winter home for a circus, seemed like a good idea where Nicole lives. But now they know a dangerous leopard is on the loose and other animals might be loose too. Great storytelling, adventure, survival again, and having vital knowledge are all part of this series. Book three, Eruption, is out on March 1st of next year. Oh. Quest for the Spark by Tom Signal. Now this, I can't decide. They say it's a novel by Tom Signioski. Mm -hmm. It's also by Jeff Smith. I looked into this and they... Jeff, Jeff Smith did the original comics. Yes. So maybe they're giving maybe him they're, credit, and then, and then Tom, Tom wrote Sig the novel. That might version. be it. Yeah. Thorn, the queen, is gravely ill. Tom Elm and his raccoon friend Roderick should be helping his parents with the turnip crop. But before long, he has encountered Percival Bone and his niece and nephew, and they become embroiled in fighting the dark that is trying to take over the world. So this is obviously book one. And I haven't seen the next book yet, but I'm sure it'll be out soon. I love Dragon Breath. He is hilarious. <laughs> Dragon Breath, Lair of the Bat Monster, Monster by Ursula Vernon. This is book four about Danny, who's a dragon, and his best friend Wendell, an iguana. They're in the local swimming pool when they find a small bat trapped in the pool filter. Danny's mom sends them on the mysterious bus to one of Danny's cousins in Mexico who is studying bats. A visit to the jungle, bat poo, the guano beetles that eat the poo, and maybe a huge monster will definitely appeal to readers. It's told mostly in text with numerous black, white, green, and occasional blue illustrations. Daisy Dawson at the Beach by Steve Volk. This is the fourth book. School is out and Daisy is headed to the beach with her parents. There she makes several new friends, two rabbits who want to surf, a crab who loves to dance, and a dolphin. It helps that Daisy can talk to and understand the animals, but she hasn't forgotten her animal friends at home. The Ball Hogs by Rich Wallace is the first book in the new series, Kickers. Ben, who's in fourth grade, is on a new co-ed soccer team with Mark, 
who brags about his abilities and hogs the ball. Ben knows he should be a good team player, but he hogs the ball sometimes himself because Mark has it so much. And it hurts the team. Maybe everyone needs to develop more team spirit. Well written with action on the soccer field and in the Foursquare court at school. And books two and three are out now, so you might want to look for those too. Bobby the Brave, Sometimes, by Lisa Yee, is a sequel to Bobby vs. Girls, Accidentally. Bobby is in fourth grade, and he isn't anything like his dad, a former football pro, or his older sister, now quarterback for the high school team. He accidentally overheard his father saying so. Bobby has asthma, and he tries not to draw attention to that fact. This story is about Bobby and his dad, and also Bobby's good friends. If parents are looking for a book with involved parents, this is a good choice. Nonfiction for the grades 2 to 5, Nick Bishop has lizards, amazing photos as expected, and clear, concise text introduce some of the world's lizards to the reader. One two-page fold-out shows the basilisk lizard running across water. The author photographer's comments at the back of the book about, getting some of the, about some of the difficulties of getting these photos is fascinating. Okay, this doesn't show up very well, but it's the Worst Case Scenario Survivalpedia by David Borknick. In alphabetical order, this volume gives advice on a variety of dangerous situations, each covered in a two-page spread. Good information and a surefire browser's choice, as are many of the other survival things. I checked out Surviving Mountain Lions, because one was seen recently in Seward. <laughs> Deserted Islands, Snake Bite, Electric Eels. You never know. Things might happen. I'm ready for the mountain lions, though. Okay. Red Bird Sings by Gina Capaldi and Q.L. Pierce is adapted from her autobiography. This title tells the story of Gertrude Simmons, a Sioux girl born in 1876 in South Dakota, and her journey through white schools and beyond to find herself, her talents, and to speak for her people. Math and Magic Number Tricks by Linda Colgan has 10 magic tricks that are offered and then explained. Each trick relates in some way to a mathematical principle. Good details and illustrations make it clear how to do the trick and why it usually works, but they don't always work. What to expect when you're expecting joeys, a guide for marsupial parents. Birth and development, but not insemination, in case you were worried, about a number of several marsupials in question and answer format. Good information is conveyed and illustrations dominate the page. It's a companion title to what to expect when you're expecting larva. I'm sure they're going to write more. I can't wait. It's really fun. <laughs> Kubla Khan, Emperor of Everything by Kathleen Kroll. Another excellent biography by Kroll. She acknowledges in the book how difficult it is to write about Kubla Khan since so little about him was acti actually written down by trustworthy historians. Still, she carefully fills in what she can about him and his time, and the illustrations, of course, are also impressive. Silk and Venom, Searching for a Dangerous Spider by Catherine Lasky. After an introductory chapter of information about spiders, we go join Greta Binford on a research trip to try and find a particular spider in the Dominican Republic. Good information along the way as to her methods and techniques in the field and in the lab. Well written, of course, and includes a picture glossary, sources, and index. Biomimicry, Inventions, that inspired, inventions inspired by Nature by Dora Lee takes a look at how humans have observed nature and developed structures, tools, medicine, and more that follow the shape and designs of nature. One example, early bullet trains running up to 180 miles per hour caused booms when exiting tunnels due to the buildup of air. Looking at a kingfisher led the developers to design the front of the train to be like the bird's long beak. And it's interspersed with all this kind of information. Very fascinating and a good browsing title. The Case of the Vanishing Golden Frogs by Sandra Marco this well-respected author has produced another excellent title. Marco looks at the puzzle of why the golden frogs of Panama were getting sick and dying. Scientists from around the world communicated similar problems in their area, and finally the problem and a temporary solution were found. Excellent photos enhance the text, and I think um, though we don't have a permanent solution, it's good to know that golden frogs will be around for a while. Who Was Rosa Parks by Yana Zeldis McDonough is um, a biography of Rose and Parks written in a conversational style. This series, Who Was Whoever, with the um, caricature head, is, uh, has a new number of titles. Occasional insets tell other related topics on a single page or a two-page spread, and they cover items such as the Ku Klux Klan, Jim Crow law, laws, Brown versus the Board of Education, as well as other civil rights leaders. So if you need another biography, this is in paperback. You might look at that. 
Totally Human, Why We Look and Act the Way We Do by Cynthia Pratt Nicholson. Information on questions kids will have. Why do we get hiccups? Why do we burp and fart? Oh yeah, they're going to read that page. Goofy illustrations may add or detract from the information depending on your reader's point of view, because they all look like the cover here. The answers often refer to evolution and genes. Inkbot by Margaret Payot. It's a bit of history and then a how-to of inkblot art. The artist author shares methods of making inkblots and continues with how to draw within your inkblots. Numerous examples will help to inspire young artists. And I think this book could be used for all kinds of age levels. Look at that building by Scott Ritchie. Just what it says, a good first look at how buildings are designed. The kids need to build a doghouse for Max, so they go to the library, yes, gather information, and we eavesdrop on what they learn. Tales of Famous Heroes by Peter and Connie Roop. 18 figures of history or current day are covered in this title. Six pages are de devoted to each person, in including Sacaguaya, Winston Churchill, Nelson Mandela, Sonia Sotomayor, and one group, the Tuskegee Airmen. All are positive biographies with readable text and caricature type image at the beginning of each entry. Henry Knox, bookseller, soldier, patriot by Anita Sylvie tells of this lesser known patriot and his skills at using artillery during the Revolutionary War, as well as his almost impossible task of bringing the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga to Boston. The trek of 300 miles with heavy equipment over lakes and mountains was amazing. Well written with wonderful illustrations. If the World were a Village, a book about the world's people by David L. Smith. This is a second edition and it's an update. It includes some new information as well as um, information that was in the first book. Path of the Pronghorn by Kat Urbigit is a good introduction to the pronghorn and its life cycle, including information for report writers. Excellent photos will draw in readers, including a page noting that the pronghorn almost became extinct and I had kind of forgotten that. Weird But True 3 by National Geographic. Usually one, two, or three facts and sentences per page. It's a great browsing, browsing item. Every square inch of your skin hosts about six million bacteria. Did you want to know that? Uh, yeah. Kids who, a British man <laughs> ate 36 cockroaches in one minute. It doesn't say why, okay. but he did, <laughs> apparently. Why is it hard? Children and adults share words of wisdom. Wonderful photographs highlight this collection of advice and window wisdom from people of all ages. Some names we will recognize, Jane Yolen, Tom Hanks, some are kids from somewhere in the world. Lots to think about and discuss as a class, a family, and as friends. Picture books. Okay, yeah, I know, time's going by. <laughs> Ten Little Puppies, Diez Perritos by Alma for Ada. As it says on the front cover, this book is adapted from a traditional nursery rhyme in Spanish. Enjoyable fun as a girl counts ten puppies down to one. It includes both English and Spanish versions in one text. The music is given at the back of the book along with a short paragraph of information on each of the dog breeds used in the book. The Three Little Dassies by Jan Brett is a retelling of the Three Little Pigs set in Southern Africa. Dassies are also called rock hyraxes. In this version, the eagle is a predator they must outwit. It's great fun and, of course, wonderful illustrations. Around Our Way on Neighbor's Bay Day by Tamika Fryer Brown, a summer day spent celebrating companionship through the neighborhood block party. The vivid colors and action portrayed, portrayed provide a sense of activity and belonging. Mama and Me by Arthur Doros is a follow-up to his 2008 title, Papa and Me. This title celebrates mothers and daughters. Spanish words and phrases are woven into the story and are understood by the context. It's another good purchase for your library. And you'd better not skip If You're a Monster and You Know It by Rebecca and Ed Emberley. You can download the song for free if you bought the book or have the kids sing it with you as you read. It's just what you think. The monsters will snort and growl, smack their claws, and more. It will sure be a noisy story time when you have this book. <laughs> Fortunately, Unfortunately by Michael Foreman is a series of events that occur when the monkey-like boy's mom asks him to take Granny's umbrella back to her. From whales to pirates to dinosaur, the boy encounters alternately fortunate and unfortunate situations. The umbrella is key. It's a silly and fun imaginative adventure. Diary of a Baby Wombat by Jackie French is a follow-up to her Diary of a Wombat. French gives us another humorous look at the lives and needs of wombats. This time, of course, the baby wombat goes exploring every day, encounters a human baby, someone to play with, and eventually goes into the house. 
This is great fun. <laughs> substitute Creature by Chris Gall. Reminiscent of Miss Nelson is when the substitute teacher arrives promptly at 8 a.m., Mr. Creature warns them, quote, if you're plotting some mystery mischief, please don't even try. In the back of my head, you'll find more than one high. He proceeds to let them know some of the stories of the children he taught that misbehaved and suffered the consequences, all told in rhyme. I Spy with My Little Eye by Edward Gibbs. A round hole in the middle of the page gives a clue along with the text as to what might be on the following page. Kids will love figuring out the clues and guessing what the next animal might be. Chicken Big by Keith Graves. A big, humongous chicken hatches out of a large egg, and the other chickens aren't sure what it is. Maybe it's an elephant. The chick saves the day several times, prompting the other chickens to change their minds about what he is. An umbrella, a sweater, and more. It's fun and silly. This is a great book, Perfect Square by Michael Hall. Wonderfully creative look at how to make something out of something else. A perfect square is perfectly happy with its four corners and equal sides, and then is cut into pieces, pieces and punched with holes on Monday. So it makes itself into a fountain. As you go through the page, you see all this happening. Each day of the week, something different happens, and the square makes itself into something else. Until Sunday, when nothing happens. This, and the square takes care of everything itself. It's great infra inspiration for art projects with torn cut and punched paper. Little White Rabbit by Kevin Hankies. The Little White Rabbit goes exploring and wonders things like, what would it be like to be green or to be tall? And the following illustration will illustrate what he's thinking. A fun adventure until he encounters a cat and hurries back to his mother and siblings. Miss Dorothy and Her Bookmobile by Gloria Houston is a quiet story about a girl who lent her books to the neighborhood kids, knowing she would grow up to be a librarian. There was no brick building for her. Instead, she ended up driving a bookmobile in the mountains of North Carolina. Dorothy took books around the area and shared her love of reading with everyone. The author's note at the back of the book tells us Dorothy was a real bookmobile librarian remembered fondly by many. The Odious Ogre by Norton Juster. A horrible, worst of all, ogre is used to getting his way. But when he encounters a young lady who has never heard of him, and she offers him some tea, he is flabbergasted. Why isn't she screaming, collapsing on the ground? The ogre is at a loss as to how to deal with her. Stand Straight, Ella Kate by Kate Cleese. Born in 1872, Ella was just like any other baby, but when she was seven, she began to grow much faster than any other child. This fictionalized story of a real person tells of her loving parents who kept her home to save her from the taunts and teasings of others. But at age 18 and at 8 feet tall, she chose to go to Chicago and be featured at a museum. An author's note at the back of the book fills in some more information about Ella Kate Ewing. Um, Bats at the Ball Game by Brian Lies continues the series that started with Bats at the Beach. Get yourself a mothball or a box of cricket jacks. Find your seat and get ready for the game. And please look for the young bat who's still wearing his water wings from that first book. Great fun. Me, Jane by Patrick McDonald is a tribute to, not a biography of, Jane Goodall. It also encourages children to realize that they can dream dreams, which may come true someday. Bulldog's Big Day by Kate McMullen. Bulldog leaves home to look for a job and sees many creatures hurrying to work. He tries firefighter, window washer, and more, but is not successful. He leaves a cookie he baked with each of the animals. At day's end, he finds a line of animals at his door asking for more cookies. Hey, that'll be his job, having his own bakery. Lively art and busy pages will appeal to young listeners. Eddie Gets Ready for School by David Milgram. Eddie has apparently discovered checklists. The end papers contain a humorous assortment including sneak cookie, check, put cookie back, check, sneak brownie, check. Each two-page spread has one or two checklist items plus checks in a text with an illustration of the checked item. Eddie is exuberant in getting ready for school, although a few checklist items do not pass mom's approval. Watch cartoons, drink root beer. The final page, give myself three cheers, I did it. It's a great introduction to the idea of checklists and how they might be used. First Grade Jitters by Robert Quackenbush was originally published in 1982. This edition has new illustrations and the story still holds true. The boy is worried about first grade. Kindergarten was fine, but first grade will be different and he doesn't know what to expect. His friends, who have been gone all summer, are the ones to help him with his jitters. Tiny Little Fly by Michael Rosen. The tiny fly teases the elephant, the hippo, and the tiger, and each is sure they will catch him, but off he goes. Exuberant art and the slight text makes the story shine. 
One two-page spread fold-out shows the three large animals unable to capture the fly. Where's Walrus by Stephen Savage. A zookeeper is looking all over town for the missing walrus, but can't find him anywhere. Can you? Young children will have fun with this, since the walrus usually isn't too hard to spot, but interesting how he can blend in with the scenery. A Pet for Petunia by Paul Schmidt. Petunia loves her toy skunk and makes all kinds of promises because she wants, wants, wants a real pet skunk. When her parents say no because they stink, she has a fit and runs away. Then she meets a real skunk and realizes that they do stink. Maybe her toy skunk is the best until she sees a real life porcupine. Interrupting Chicken by David Ezra Stein. Papa gets ready to read a bedtime story to Little Red Chicken, but just as the story starts, she interrupts. With Hansel and Gretel, she says, Don't go in! She's a witch! So Hansel and Gretel didn't the end. Kids will love it, especially if they are already familiar with the tales Papa tries to read. <coughs> Excuse me. This could create trouble for reading aloud if you're reading fairy tales at your story time, <laughs> but it's great fun. Press Here by Hervé Tele. It's great fun also with colored spots on a white background. The text is simple. Press here and then turn the page. And one do yellow dot becomes two. Press again and dots in yellow, blue, and red appear. Tilting the book and more add to the fun. Colleen A.F. Venable has written And Then There Were Gnomes and also The Ferret's Foot. These are books two and three of the Pet Shop Private Eye series, which is a graphic novel for very young readers. Sass Path is a private eye and a guinea pig, and her assistant Hamisher, a Hamish, and, and then there were gnomes, must investigate the possibility of a ghost in the pet shop. Why else would there be strange spots of cold air? In the ferrets afoot, Sass Pants and Hamisher must solve the mystery of who is vandalizing the signs on the cages of the pets. Is your buffalo ready for kindergarten? By Audrey Vernick. Kids will love the sight of a buffalo trying to use the scissors, almost using the swings outside, and getting ready for picture day. Silly and fun, it will still give children an idea of what to expect at kindergarten. And I don't know, maybe your buffalo needs to get ready. I love Scaredy Squirrel, he's my guy. Scaredy Squirrel has a birthday party by Melanie Watt. Scaredy is up to his usual tricks. He does a great job of planning his own birthday party, but he only invites himself, since that is the safest thing to do. Then he decides to invite his friend Buddy the dog. Buddy shows up with a bunch of puppies in tow. Scaredy panics and ends up playing dead. Finally, everyone has a good time. Scaredy falls back on his, his uh, playing dead as his backup action for everything. Art and Max by David <coughs> Weisner. Arthur is a skilled artist. Max is an enthusiastic newcomer. Max doesn't know what to paint, and when Art suggests Max paint him, Max takes him literally. <laughs> this is the begin just the beginning of the problems for Art. Great fun, excellent illustrations, and an opportunity for an interesting discussion about art styles and approaches, and how one is not better than the other than another. Elsie's Bird by Jane Yolen. After her mother's death, death, Elsie and her father moved from Boston to the Nebraska prairie. Yes. Elsie finds the change is hard, missing her mother and the city she knew. She stays inside their soddy, soddy, not venturing outside at all, until her parakeet flies away while her father has gone to town. Elsie runs after him to try and lure him back into the cage and slowly becomes enthralled with the prairie. Beginning readers. Nick Bishop has a beginning reader about butterflies. Large colorful photographs highlight this, the text. Um, it is unfortunate that it's not currently available in hardback but only paperback. Scat Cat by Alyssa Satin Cappuccilli. A small cat is lost, and as he walks along through the city and into the country, he cannot find any rest. Everyone keeps telling him to scat. Pearl and Wagner, Four Eyes by Kate McMullen. An eye test at school results in Wagner needing glasses. He does not like them, and at the bus stop, Pearl must encourage him to wear them. When some bullies call him names, he throws his glasses in his backpack. backpack. But his friends have a creative solution to the problem. Little Bear and the Marco Polo by Elsa Homeland Minerick. Little Bear and Grandfather are in the attic when they open a trunk and find the old sea captain hat and coat father Grandfather used to wear. They talk about his old ship, the Marco Polo, and where it could take them. Still, Grandfather is quite happy at home with Grandmother. Mr. Putty and Petter and Tabby clear the decks by Cynthia Ryland. Mr. Putty and Petter and Tabby are bored and hot. Mrs. Teaberry has an idea, a tour on an old boat. 
It is great fun, except for Tabby. Tabby does not want to be on the boat. But Zeke does not want to leave the boat when the tour is over. Mouse and Mole, A Winter Wonderland by Wong Herber Yi. Mouse wants to play in the snow, but Mole wants to stay warm in bed. Mouse skates and builds a snowman by herself, but is lonely. When Mole sees the snowman on her sled, he thinks someone is following her, so he gets dressed and runs outside, and soon they are both having fun in the snow. And of course, Mighty Machines, Road Rollers by Derek Zobo. Clear full color photographs dominate the pages with usually two sentences and large text. They're bound to be popular. And the last category, picture book nonfiction. Pika, Life in the Rocks by Tannis Bill is an introduction to the life of a pika living in the Rocky Mountains. Plenty of excellent photographs add to the brief text, which contain one to five sentences per page, and it includes some pika facts at the back of the book. Okay, I'm not going to pronounce this. <laughs> Brian P. Cleary has written Six Sheep Sip Thick Shakes Very and nice. other tongue twisters. <laughs> it contains 24 tongue t twisters with humorous, colorful illustrations. But my favorite part of this book is a page at the back, which is Make Your Own Tongue Twisters, and it gives um, everybody a way to design their own tongue twisters, Ooh. which would be a great challenge for readers and, and uh, patrons in your library. Leo the Snow Leopard by Juliana Hackoff and, uh, and others. The story of the rescue of snow leopard cub found all alone in the Karakoram Mountains of Pakistan by a local man, a goat herder. The cub story shows the cooperation of several organizations and a zoo to keep him safe and give him a home. Numerous excellent photographs enhance the story. How to Clean a Hippopotamus by Steve Jenkins and Robin, Robin Page has lots of illustrations, several two-page two spreads, highlight good information in this book on symbiosis. All animals are identified in the final pages of the book. There's No Place Like School, Classroom Poems by Jack Kroletsky, who is the editor of the book, actually. Various poets provide 18 poems about school. For example, Why the Class Frog is Purple by Callie Dockles. We were painting a mural today. The frog got loose. What can I say? My favorite is The Drinking Fountain on page 15. Gaiku, A Year of Haiku for Boys by Bob Raska. Following the seasons and beginning with spring, this title offers 24 haiku poems aimed at boys. The author covers bike riding, tree climbing, sipping, skipping stones, and pondering the night sky. Just One Bite by Lola Schaefer is a look at how much one animal's bite can contain and how large or small their mouths are. The artwork carries the book. Kids will be fascinated by the illustration sizes. Twelve animals, from microorganisms and worm to elephant and sperm whale, are included. Brief information is listed on the, at the back on each of the animals. And the last book by Frank Serafini is Looking Closely in the Rainforest. This is part of the Looking Closely series, which shows a series of photos on the first page only the center of the, of the page has a circle in it which shows part of the photo and the rest is black. And then when you turn the page, you guess what's, what that's a picture of, turn the page and find out if you're right or not. And kids love this kind of look and see book that um, I think it was Tana Holman, the first person who did this kind of thing that I remember. And thank you for listening to me far longer than usual. <laughs> really appreciate having the opportunity to talk about all these books. Yeah, I, I put a couple books on my wish list. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, and we have a question. Yes. We have a question from Haley, who's 10. Oh, hello, and Haley. She wants to know which ones are your favorites. <gasps> oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, origami, a couple to pick from. Origami Yoda okay. um, is one of my favorites by Tom Engelberger. And I do, because I like fairy tales, I do really like the Tales of the Five Kingdoms by Vivian French. And the one I talked about today was The Flight of Dragons. And it includes, um, I like the, the helpful bats and the troll and the true heart, Gracie Gillypot, who always struggles to come through to save the day for anything. So being a fairy tale fan, that's a popular one. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And I do also love graphic novels, so, you know. <laughs> I can't stop now. Thank you for uh, asking. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and she says cool. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, we've gone long, almost a full 90 minutes here. So you, you need a drink of water? Are you, I do. You I okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sally, for that. I know this is always a very popular show every year. We make you do it after conference. So, um, and uh, you should see her bookshelves in her office. She's, 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 yeah. Um, and my floor. And, and your my floor, chairs. your desk. Right, exactly. 
So um, thank you all for attending today. We uh, have been recording this, and that recording will go up shortly. Uh, we'll also create an audio podcast of this. Um, and next week, I know I'll be doing my tech talk. We'll be talking to the librarian in black, uh, Sarah Houghton, from the San Rafael County Public Library out in California. Great. So very, very different topic next week. Yes. Uh, and you're all welcome to attend. And uh, we're getting some Merry Christmases and Happy Holidays coming through. Oh, thank you. So thank you all. Uh, we're going to uh, let you go have lunch or whatever. And uh, thank you very much for attending. Bye. Bye. -bye.